Merci. Buonasera a tutti. Sono Sara Federle, presidente del gruppo Astrofili di Schio e a nome di tutto il gruppo vi do il benvenuto a questa quinta conferenza del ciclo Stargate, una finestra sull'universo, organizzata per il quarantesimo anniversario del gruppo Astrofili di Schio. Noi del gruppo Astrofili è da anni che siamo impegnati nella divulgazione astronomica tramite conferenze, mostre di astronomia e osservazioni del cielo perché vogliamo cercare di trasmettere la nostra grande passione per l'astronomia a quanta più gente possibile. E l'anno scorso, quando mi sono resa conto che il 2018 sarebbe stato il quarantesimo anniversario del nostro gruppo, ho cominciato a pensare, ma cosa si potrebbe fare per eh, festeggiare alla grande quest'anno speciale? E eh, allora ho cominciato a mandare mail in giro, anche ad astrofisici di fama mondiale. E il professor Kip Thorn eh, ha gentilmente risposto ad una delle mie email e poi il 2 luglio dell'anno scorso ha confermato la sua disponibilità a venire a tenere una conferenza qui a Schio, cosa che mi ha mandato letteralmente fuori di testa, come penso tre quarti della platea, giusto? Grazie. Eh, però l'organizzazione di questo grande evento non sarebbe stata possibile senza eh, il contributo delle associazioni industriali Confindustria di Vicenza, che ringraziamo dal più profondo del nostro cuore, e senza i nostri sponsor che abbiamo trovato tra le aziende e le banche dei dintorni e che hanno finanziato tutti gli eventi eh, di quest'anno e che sono Alpac, AZ, Banca Alto Vicentino, CSC, Ecam Richard, Officina Stellare, Quasar, Ugolini, Famila, C Laser, Industria Mazzon, Banca Mediolanum, Officine dal Zotto, San Donà Roberto SRL, TM, Sovem Service, Alca Technology, Arco Profil, Banca San Giorgio, Creden Banca, Deltamac, Pulsar, Quantum 137, R51 Travel e RBian. Grazie veramente. Dobbiamo ringraziare anche il Comune di Schio che ci ha concesso il patrocinio per tutti gli eventi eh, di quest'anno, compresa questa conferenza, e che è rappresentato stasera da diversi membri dell'amministrazione comunale e dal sindaco Walter Orsi, a cui cedo la parola per un breve saluto. Grazie. Lo spazio-tempo, è... ma vieni, vieni vicino a me. <ride> no, io... Buonasera a tutti, professor Thorn, benvenuto a nome della città, del nostro territorio. È un grande onore averla qua con noi. E quando eh, e Sara eh, mi ha parlato di questo evento l'anno scorso e eh, ha entusiasmato tutti, eh, io gli ho fatto una domanda dopo che è arrivata la notizia che il professor Thorne era stato insignito del, del Nobel. Ma se per i 40 anni voi portate un Nobel, quando ne compierete 100? Ma io sarò morta, quindi non ho <ride> problema. Sei troppo giovane. È giovane, per, mancano solo 60 anni, insomma, sarà, con l'energia che ha, secondo me, sarà ancora qua a saltellare sul palco con chissà quale, eh, magari personaggio di qualche altro mondo, eh, perché siamo avanti così. Comunque è veramente un grande, un grande onore. Eh, Gruppo Astofili è una, una realtà silenziosa nel nostro territorio, ma molto presente e che ha cominciato eh, un'attività diversi anni fa, nel cercare di rendere commestibile, io uso questo termine, ai più, a coloro che magari non masticano, non conoscono eh, bene i termini o non conoscono i misteri eh, dello spazio, una materia così, eh, così difficile e complicata. 
e hanno iniziato anche con un festival della scienza, l'anno scorso è stato bellissimo, è stata la prima edizione, è stato bellissimo, e è una continua escalation. Il nostro territorio non è avulso dalla, da, questi, da questi temi, Le, molte delle aziende che sono state citate prima come sponsor di questo evento eh, e molte altre e che sono presenti nel nostro territorio, non solo nell'area industriale di Schio, ma nel territorio dell'Alto Vicentino. Eh, sono aziende che nel mondo della scienza, nel mondo della ricerca, nel mondo delle forniture speciali per i grandi enti come eh, la NASA, come l'ESA, come eh, il centro eh, di ricerca eh, di Ginevra, bravi, nel CERN, che abbiamo visitato anche l'anno scorso con una delegazione di ragazzi che è stata premiata dopo una manifestazione eh, che parlava del, eh, dell'innovazione. Ebbene, queste aziende sono presenti, lavorano, producono innovazione e sono eh, il proseguo del, di quella che è un DNA del nostro territorio, vocato all'innovazione proprio dalle sue, dalle sue radici. La cosa più bella che mi ha colpito questa sera quando sono entrato e quando è entrato il professor Thorn è stato quello di vedere tantissimi ragazzi presenti in platea, tantissimi ragazzi che si sono avvicinati al professore per chiedere anche l'autografo, una fotografia. E vedete, è una bellissima realtà, perché eh, se parlassimo di un calciatore, se parlassimo di un musicista, non, magari non ci si stupirebbe. Mentre invece parlando di un grande uomo di scienza, e vedere che, anche le, che ci sono le nuove generazioni che sono vocate, sono quelle che costruiranno, che, ricer che ricercheranno e costruiranno il, il nostro futuro. È, è un bellissimo messaggio positivo che viene dato. E questo è il DNA di questo territorio, che si tramanda di generazione in generazione. Quindi io, ringraziando, non volendo portare via tempo alla, alla conferenza di un personaggio così illustre di cui ci onoriamo di avere la presenza, Ringrazio ancora il gruppo Astrofili, le associazioni industriali, tutte le aziende che hanno collaborato per la realizzazione di questo evento e auguro a tutti voi una buona serata. Grazie mille. Tocca di nuovo a me. Vi rubo ancora pochissimo tempo. Il professor Kip Thorn, abbiamo detto, è un astrofisico di fama mondiale, ha studiato a fondo l'astrofisica relativistica, i buchi neri, i wormhole che sono i tunnel nell'iperspazio che collegano punti lontanissimi dell'universo e, eh, e le onde gravitazionali ed è stato tra i fondatori di LIGO che è l'osservatorio con cui nel 2015 queste onde teorizzate, cen teorizzate cent'anni prima da Albert Einstein con la sua teoria della relatività generale, eh, sono state scoperte. Perché ci è voluto 30 anni? Perché ai tempi di Einstein la tecnologia eh, non era abbastanza all'avanguardia e queste onde hanno un'ampiezza piccolissima e quindi per eh, riuscire a rivelarle eh, è servito l'intervento del professor Kip Thorn, che eh, per questo motivo poi a ottobre dell'anno scorso è stato insignito del premio Nobel per la fisica. Ecco però, oltre a tutti i grandi riconoscimenti internazionali che ha vinto, il professor Kip Thorn è anche un grandissimo divulgatore. Ha scritto eh, libri molto belli come Buchi neri e salti temporali, che è stato uno dei suoi primi libri che ho letto, e, eh, e ha collaborato con eh, diversi registi per eh, rendere astrofisicamente realistici alcuni film come il mitico Interstellar di Christopher Nolan. E, e, e poi si dedica alle conferenze divulgative. E, e qui non, vi rubo, non vi rubo altro tempo, questa sera il professor Kip Thorne ci, eh, ci parlerà di Big Bang, buchi neri e onde gravitazionali in una conferenza dal titolo Exploring the Universe with Gravitational Waves from the Big Bang to Black Holes. Signore e signori, il professor Kip Thorne. Can you hear me? 
Yes, thank you, Sara, for that wonderful introduction and for organizing this uh, great event. You've been a great organizer. I must tell the audience, only twice in my career have I agreed to give a lecture for uh, Amateur Astronomy Society. This is one of those two times. So. And, and this is because Sarah was so persuasive that I could not say no. So thank you. <laughs> 1.3 billion years ago, when multicell life was just forming on Earth, I've been in a galaxy far, far away. Two black holes circled around each other. These are the shadows of the black holes as they would have looked to your eyes if you had been there. They spiraled around, spiraled together, collided, and emitted a great burst of gravitational waves, which I will explain in a few minutes. These gravitational waves carried off so much energy that it was the same as if you had annihilated three suns and turned that entirely into gravitational wave energy. It came off so quickly that the power output, the amount of energy that came in a unit of time, was 50 times bigger than the power output from all of the stars in the universe put together. 50 universe luminosities, brightnesses, in one-tenth of a second, carrying off three solar masses of gravitational wave energy. The gravitational wave burst traveled outward from the galaxy in which those black holes lived into the great reaches of intergalactic space, across the space between the galaxies. And 50,000 years ago, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, the gravitational wave burst reached the outer reaches of our own Milky Way galaxy. For 50,000 years, this burst traveled across our galaxy until on 14 September 2015, it reached the Earth. It reached the Earth first at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. This burst of waves traveled upward through the Earth, unaffected by all the matter in the Earth. It penetrated through the Earth and emerged at the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory in Louisiana, Livingston, Louisiana, near the city of New Orleans. Seven one thousandths of a second later, it emerged at the gravitational wave detector in Hanford, Washington, not far from the city of Seattle. The team of the LIGO scientists and the Virgo scientists and I will explain these teams later. Uh, they analyzed the data together. The Italians played a major role in the data analysis, although the instruments were in America. Uh, and after several months of carefully looking at the data to be absolutely sure that this really was due to a gravitational wave and not due to everything else, uh, a scrutiny examination by a team of a thousand people, and these are just a few of those 1,000 people. Uh, we, the LIGO and Virgo teams, announced the discovery of gravitational waves uh, on February the 12th, uh, 2016. This made the front pages of all the newspapers, major newspapers around the world, here in Austria, there in New York, in the United States. Uh, and it was the beginning of a whole new way to study the universe. A way that I will talk about this evening, something that will bring us huge insights into the universe that we have never had before over the coming years, decades, and centuries. Let me explain how we got here uh, in brief. Uh, how did we come to uh, build these gravitational wave detectors and discover the gravitational waves. It begins with Albert Einstein. Einstein in 1915 formulated a new description of gravity. His description is called the general theory of relativity and it describes gravity as caused by a warping of time 
and a warping of slip space. The slowing of time near the surface of the Earth produces the gravitational pull that holds us to the surface of the Earth, according to Einstein, a very strange thing. Uh, and his theory then, he developed the theory further and within a few months he made the prediction of gravitational waves. And what that prediction said is this, if out, if out in space above the Earth you spread out a large number of particles like this in a rectangular grid uh, and each of them is at rest with respect to all of the others, so they're all just sitting there at rest. Then when a gravitational wave comes by, it will move these particles apart in that direction while it's moving the particles together in this direction, as you see here. An oscillatory stretching and squeezing of the separation of the particles. This is if the gravitational waves are propagating from you into the screen. There's no motion along the direction of propagation of the waves, only perpendicular. And it's as though space were being stretched and squeezed, the space between the particles. Einstein analyzed the strength of these gravitational waves from kinds of sources of gravitational waves in the distant universe that he could imagine and concluded that it is unlikely that humans would ever be able to build detectors good enough to detect these gravitational waves because they would be so weak when they reached the Earth that they could not be detected. Nevertheless, in the uh, early 1960s, Joseph Weber, who was a professor at the University of Maryland near Washington, D.C., he embarked on an effort to detect these gravitational waves. I met Joe Weber in Les Uches, France, uh, Mont Blanc is just across the way here. This is a wonderful summer school for theoretical physics uh, founded by uh, Cécile de Witt Moret, a French, uh, superb French uh, physicist. Uh, and I was there for two months with Joe Weber and other great uh, astrophysicists and physicists. I went walking in the mountains with Joe and he convinced me that gravitational waves were a very exciting thing to uh, search for. Why did he think they could be detected when Einstein said they could not? It's because of the changes that had happened in the 50 years from Einstein to Weber. We now knew about black holes and neutron stars, objects that are strong sources of gravitational waves. They produce strong waves according to theory. Einstein did not know about these objects in 1916. And we had new technology, lasers and computers and other wonderful new technology that made possible new kinds of detectors. And so with those changes, uh, Weber was ready to go start searching for gravitational waves. He would made a search. In the end, he did not find any gravitational waves, but he motivated others to follow in his footsteps. Uh, and uh, as for me, I then, after this summer school, a few years later, I moved to Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, and there I built a research group uh, of theory, uh, theoretical physicists working on the theory of black holes and neutron stars and the gravitational waves they would produce. Uh, as I worked over the following few years with my students and with my colleagues, I came to understand that the gravitational waves would be a wonderful way to study the universe. And here I want to then highlight the difference between the electromagnetic waves with which astronomers have long studied the universe. That's light, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays. These are all electromagnetic versus the gravitational waves with which Joe Weber was proposing to uh, study the universe. The electromagnetic waves are oscillations of the electric field, the electric force and magnetic force that propagate through space and time, whereas gravitational waves are oscillations of the very fabric, the shape of space and time itself, the stretching and squeezing of space. Electromagnetic waves are incoherent superpositions of emission from individual atoms and molecules and fundamental particles 
whereas gravitational waves are emitted coherently by the motion of huge amounts of mass and energy. Electromagnetic waves are very easily absorbed and scattered by gas and dust between their source in the distant universe and the Earth. Gravitational waves are never significantly absorbed or scattered. Even if they are created at the birth of the universe, they can still come to us and bring a picture of what was happening in the birth of the universe. With these huge differences, it was clear to me in the early 1970s well, in 1972, when I wrote the first paper of a vision of what you would do with gravitational waves, together with William Press, a student of mine, that many sources of gravitational waves would not be seen with electromagnetic telescopes. And the colliding black holes were an example. We have never seen, never yet seen, any light, x-rays, or other electromagnetic waves from colliding black holes, only gravitational waves. And if you can detect gravitational waves, they're likely to bring huge surprises that uh, we were not expecting, a huge change in our understanding of the universe. So the possibilities for revolutionizing, uh, making a radical change in our knowledge of the universe with gravitational waves were so great that I thought if only they can be detected, I will work together with the experimenters to help make it happen. The experimenter I be, uh, ended up working with most closely was Rainer Weiss at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in Boston, near Boston, Caltech, where I live, is, is uh, near Los Angeles, so opposite ends of the United States. In 1972, at the same time as I was presenting a vision for what we would do with gravitational waves, Ray Weiss proposed a new kind of gravitational wave detector. He said, let's take four mirrors, hang them from overhead supports, uh, with a, and send a laser beam in, and bounce the laser beam back and forth between these mirrors, split the beam in half, bounce the other half of the beam back and forth here, recombine the beams at this, what we call a beam splitter, a photo detector will measure the light that comes out, and the theory of interference, as we call it, uh, predicts that when these mirrors are pushed apart and those are pushed together, the intensity of this light will go up. But when these are pushed apart and those are pushed together, the intensity of the light goes down. So you see the light going brighter and dimmer, brighter, dimmer, as the gravitational wave passes through. So that was his idea for a gravitational wave detector. Now, I heard about this idea. I had not yet read the paper he wrote, the technical paper that he wrote about this. It was a remarkable paper because in it he identified all of the kinds of noise that these instruments would have to uh, confront, the major kinds of noise, and he described how to deal with that noise, how to circumvent it, uh, and then computed what sensitivity could be achieved. And he claimed that if he built these so that they were several kilometers long, these uh, gravity wave detectors, or interferometers as he called them, if they were several kilometers long, then he would be able to see the gravitational waves that my colleagues, we theorists, were predicting. I heard about this at the same time as I was writing what has become a famous textbook about relativity with uh, John Wheeler and Charles Misner. And uh, I thought he was crazy or stupid or both. And so in this textbook, I had not yet read his paper. This was me stupid. I didn't read the paper first. I didn't, uh, because we were finishing this textbook at the moment that he, I heard about his idea. So I simply wrote in, the, uh, in there that this is not a promising idea. And let me explain why I thought it was not promising. So I'm going to describe the motion of these mirrors that is produced by the gravitational waves that I, as a theorist, was expecting to see. If we begin with one centimeter and we divide by 100, we get the thickness of a human hair. If we divide by 100 again, we get the wavelength of the light that's used to measure the motions of these mirrors. If we divide by, I'm sorry, if we divide by 10,000, we get the diameter of an atom. 
if we divide by 100,000, we get the diameter of the nucleus down at the center of the atom. If we divide by 1,000, we get the uh, magnitude of the mirror motions that I thought we might have to uh, measure. That just seemed to me crazy. Trying to use light to measure motions of a mirror that are one trillion times smaller than the wavelength of light just sounded totally crazy to me. But then I studied his technical paper. I talked with Weiss. I talked with Vladimir Braginsky, a superb Russian uh, experimental physicist with whom I was developing a close collaboration uh, on joint research. And I became convinced. And once I was convinced, I decided that I and my research group of theorists should do everything we could to help Weiss uh, and his experimental colleagues discover gravitational waves. And so that is what I have done for the rest of my career, for much of the rest of my career. I've done a few other things on the side, like interstellar, but uh, mostly I've, I've worked on this. Okay. Uh, so in 1976, then, I convinced Caltech, my uh, uh, university where I work, that we should start a gravitational wave experiment group. We brought Ronald Drever, a superb experimental physicist from Glasgow, Scotland, to lead our group. Uh, because he had invented some very clever improvements on Ray Weiss's design. Uh, under his leadership, under uh, Drever's leadership, we at Caltech built a 40-meter prototype gravity wave detector. That was one one-hundredth the length of the arms that we ultimately had in LIGO, just 1% of the uh, total size. But this was 40-meter long. Uh, separation between the mirrors. In the meantime, at MIT, Ray Weiss completed the construction of a very small uh, prototype interferometer, just one and a half meters are long. But more importantly, he carried out a feasibility study for uh, what all the problems that you would have to face in trying to build a uh, gravity wave detectors with uh, kilometer length arms. In 1984, uh, based on the results of the work with the prototypes, but not just at Caltech and MIT, but also in Glasgow, Scotland, and in Garking, Germany, uh, Garking, a superb research group led by uh, Hans, Heinz Billings, uh, we at uh, Caltech and MIT combined together to create LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And for three years, LIGO was led by Weiss, Drever, and me. We were the most dysfunctional, the most incompetent leaders that any big science project has ever had. Uh, and so uh, we were told by 1986, uh, late 1986, if you want to do this, you get a single director who has the power and the authority to make decisions uh, as they have to be made, uh, and uh, who will force the two groups at Caltech and MIT to work together better. So we brought on a man named Robbie Volt, who had been the first chief scientist, the chief, first scientific leader at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a Caltech uh, facility. Uh, that uh, is in charge of all of the space missions, uh, the planetary space missions. And Robbie then led us in the writing a proposal to the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, in 1989, in which we were said we would build the huge vacuum systems in which these laser beams would bounce back and forth, the facilities. We would then uh, build two generations of gravitational wave interferometers or detectors, two of de gravitational wave detectors, we call them interferometers, uh, that uh, uh, were originally designed then by Ray Weiss with uh, Ronald Drever's improvements. We would build initial interferometers that would not, for which we would have to be very lucky, nature would have to be very kind if we were going to see anything. We would probably not see anything. And then with everything we learned from this initial 
set of instruments, we would build an, a set of advanced interferometers which would find the gravitational wave. So that was the plan that we said in 1989. Uh, because we said we will build the first instruments and fail to see waves, we had to work hard to convince uh, Congress to give us what turned out in the end to be $1 billion uh, and to convince the National Science Foundation to go forward. Uh, but by 1992, they were convinced that if we succeeded, the payoff, the results for us, human knowledge of the universe would be so exciting that it would be worth it. And so uh, we got the funding beginning in 1992. And from then until now, we have been supported without any serious question, with no serious cuts of budget, by the uh, National Science Foundation of the U.S., and by Congress in the U.S. In 1994, we brought on a new leader, the man named Barry Barish, who shared the Nobel Prize with me and Ray Weiss. Why? Because he was the person who really designed the collaboration, organized the collaboration. He expanded LIGO uh, from a set of 50 scientists and engineers, 5-0, 50 at Caltech plus MIT, to what is now uh, about 1,200, 1,200 scientists and engineers in 80 different universities and laboratories in 18 nations. Uh, and he led us in constructing our initial interferometers. He was stolen away from us, taken away by another set of physicists who work in the area of high energy to lead the design of their next generation of instruments in that other field of science. And so we brought on two success, successive directors, Jay Marks and David Reitze, who led us in completing the and searches for gravitational with waves with the initial interferometers. We saw nothing, which was precisely what I had predicted we would see nothing. We would have to be lucky, very lucky, and we weren't that lucky. Uh, and then led us in the uh, construction and installing of these advanced interferometers, uh, 2010 to 2015. So it's a long story. I remind you, began uh, with uh, me uh, and Ray Weiss back in the uh, 1960s, the mid-1960s when we started thinking about it. So it's, it has been now 50 years, half a century in the story that I have told, told to you. Uh, but we needed something more. We also needed computer simulations of the collisions of black holes. And that was a 60-year effort. And in the 1990s, it was not going well. We needed these simulations so that when we saw gravitational waves and we thought they were from black holes, the only way we could be sure would be to compare the theoretical wave shapes of oscillations with, uh, that come from these simulations of colliding black holes. Compare that with the observations. None of us were clever enough to solve Einstein's equations to predict the wave shapes from colliding black holes. We had to rely on the computer for this. So in the uh, 1990s, I was the uh, advisor to a worldwide collaboration of uh, computer, uh, computational physicists who were doing these simulations and it was not going well. And so I left LIGO. I emphasize that I left day-to-day -day involvement in LIGO. I was not part of the discovery. But I left in order to start an effort at Caltech in collaboration with a superb group at Cornell that was already working on simulations so that we could push these simulations forward and have them done in time for the first discoveries. And we did, and they were done, and several other research groups around the world were also able to uh, do the simulations by 2015 when the first waves came in. September 14, 2015, the LIGO scientists at Louisiana and in Washington State, they were preparing for this first search with these new advanced detectors. The search was supposed to begin in three days. Preparation meant that these are very complicated detectors, changing them, tweaking them, adjusting them so that they are in an optimal form to begin the search. And while that was being done, the slight changes to tune the detectors, the first waves came in. 
the director of LIGO declared this first search has begun to freeze the shape of the form of the detectors now like it is and it will stay in that form through the first search which will last about four months. And so, uh, and I have told you then the signal came in, we analyzed it for several months and announced the discovery. This is what the signal looked like, the raw signal uh, at uh, Livingston, Louisiana. It was such a strong signal, you can see it with your eyes. And this is the same thing in Hanford, Washington. It's the same signal except for a small amount of noise on it. And when the signal was cleaned up, so it became this gray band, uh, this is the signal shape. Uh, and compared with the uh, theoretical prediction, which is the red line that came from our simulations, uh, the Caltech Cornell simulations of the group that I formed together with Cornell, uh, the agreement was perfect. Now let me tell you what we are plotting. Plotting up is the stretch of the separation between two of the mirrors and uh, when it goes negative, that's the squeeze. And so it's the separation of the mirrors changing, stretching, squeezing. Up is stretch, uh, down is squeeze. And so it's a particular shape and from that shape and from comparing with the simulations, we could conclude that this was two black holes colliding and merging, and the movie I showed you came from the simulations that produced this wave shape that agrees with the observations. So that movie from the beginning was of precisely this collision. Uh, the first two, uh, two, two black holes, we conclude by comparing the simulations, were 29 and 36 times as heavy as the sun. That's a total of 65 times as heavy as the sun. The final black hole after these two black holes merge is 62 solar masses. So three solar masses, the mass of three suns is gone, converted into gravitational waves. And this has occurred at a distance of 1.3 billion light years, what I told you at the beginning of the lecture. So this was very exciting for us that at last, after a 50 year effort, uh, we had seen these gravitational waves. By now, we have seen the uh, collisions of six gravitational wave, of six black hole pairs. These are the wave shapes for the various black hole pairs that we saw. And they have various masses, 29 and 13 solar masses, 14 and 8 solar masses. They are at distances that range uh, up to 3 billion light years. And the closest is, is the first one we saw at 1.3 billion light years. Uh, and so we are beginning to build up an understanding of the population of black holes in the universe from these observations. Now, it's very important to be able to tell the X-ray astronomers, the optical astronomers, the radio wave astronomers, where to look on the sky to search for any kind of electromagnetic signals that came. And we get that information mostly by the delay in time of the arrival of this gravity wave signal at, two, at different detectors. I told you that the first signal uh, arrived initially in Louisiana and then seven one thousandths of a second later uh, in uh, Hanford, Washington. And from that, we were able to say that on the sky that that first signal uh, let me find which one it is. This one here. It is in that huge uh, error box. It's inside that region on the sky. It covers, almost reaches around the whole sky. It reaches from uh, basically the eastern horizon to the western horizon at the right time of day. Uh, but it's a little better constrained in the north-south direction because their detectors are separated in the north-south direction. Uh, this is very discouraging if you can't say better than this where the uh, signal came from. Fortunately, uh, around the 1st of August of last year, a third gravitational wave detector began to operate. It is in Pisa, Italy. It's a collaboration of 19 laboratories, uh, 250 scientists in France, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, and Hungary. And with 
three detectors, we could then determine where the source is on the sky in two dimensions. And that, that source, that signal, gravity wave signal, which we saw on August 14, is in this little region of the sky. And so now we could tell the electromagnetic astronomers, there is where you go to look. So that was wonderful. They looked, they didn't see anything. But just a few uh, days later, three days later, a new gravitational wave burst came in. And this burst, after the data were analyzed, it became clear it was not from colliding black holes. It was from these two neutron stars. Each neutron star uh, weighs one and a half times as much as the sun, and yet it's only 20 kilometers across. The density of the matter inside these uh, stars down at the center is 10 times higher than the density of the nucleus of an atom. And these neutron stars were orbiting around each other, spiraling together as they emitted gravitational waves. And because they're made out of matter, when they collided and merged, they created a giant fireball that went exploding out, emitting all forms of electromagnetic waves. Uh, this is what is called by theorists a kilonova. It was predicted to exist, these kilonovae. This was the best exa ob observed example of a kilonova from colliding neutron stars. This is the gravity wave signal. I won't discuss it. Uh, the key point is that 1.7 seconds after the two neutron stars collided, there was a burst of gamma rays. The, air, the location of the gravity wave source on the sky was in here. The gamma rays were from that region. Much worse, uh, 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 much more uncertainty from where they were coming from. But then, about an hour later, there was a big burst of x-rays and then ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio waves all coming from a galaxy at that location. It was obvious that these were the electromagnetic waves coming from the fireball. It was very exciting. It was only possible because uh, this uh, Virgo project, which was created by uh, Adalberto Giazzotto uh, here in Italy uh, and by Alain Brier in France. They were the analog of Ray Weiss and me. Uh, they created this Virgo project, and the Virgo project reached success at just the right time to combine with LIGO to make this possible. This is now what is called multi-messenger astronomy. It's the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy in which you get information from many different forms of radiation, including gravitational waves, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, radio waves. Uh, and it is the future of much of astronomy, these combined observations. And theory says that most, maybe all of the gold and platinum and other precious metals that we find here on Earth were born. They were created through nucleosynthesis, through nuclear burning, in collisions of neutron stars. And the observations of the electromagnetic waves that were made for this, uh, uh, for, uh, this gravitational wave source verified it There's, uh, the, uh, with fairly high confidence from the spectrum, the shapes, shape of the spectrum uh, of these and the light curves, how the intensity varied with time. And so there's a pretty good confirmation that that really is where the gold in your wedding band came from, from this kind of collision of two neutron stars. Now, let me tell you about uh, the future. So I'm going to sh first show you photographs of the advanced LIGO gravity wave detectors. Uh, here are the vacuum chambers in which hang the mirrors. LIGO's mirrors, one here, one there, the beam splitter that splits the light in two. Barry Barish, uh, our uh, director, uh, likes to put an American baseball player here instead of a LIGO scientist. I don't know why, but that's what he does. Uh, this is a photograph of one of the mirrors. It really is hanging by a quartz fiber. Uh, it looks like it's sitting in a, in a cradle, but in fact the cradle is not touching the mirrors. All it does is catches the mirror if the fiber breaks. 
So it's hanging and the gravitational wave pushes this back and forth by one uh, one thousandth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Uh, now these instruments are very complicated because there are so many things can go wrong. They're so complex that there are 100,000 channels of data come out of the, each instrument. Uh, they, these channels monitor everything that could go wrong, plus many things that are happening in the environment. Uh, the uh, vibrations of the earth, for example. Uh, the variations in temperature inside these chambers and so forth. Uh, and uh, that just gives you some sense of how complicated these instruments are. Uh, it is, I like to uh, say it's analogous uh, to uh, Victor Frankenstein, who built a creature and brought the creature to life and only learned the creature's personality after the creature came to life. The LIGO scientists and the Virgo scientists built their instruments brought them to life, started them up, and only began to learn their personalities afterwards because they were so complex. And they were not operating properly. There were strange things going on inside these instruments. They were close enough to uh, operating properly that we could see these gravitational waves. But they were three times worse in the distance to which they could see than they should have been. And so, uh, what has happened now is that the LIGO and Virgo detectors are shut down for a, about a year and, uh, and four months. Uh, while the, in the experimenters poke and prod and, uh, and, uh, and examine the instruments, trying to learn their personalities and coax them toward their design sensitivity, make them operate the way they're supposed to, we expect to reach that design sensitivity by about 2020. And at that point, we should be able to see three times farther into the universe, which means that we will see a volume of the universe that is three cubed times bigger, or 27 times more of the universe than we can now see. Uh, and so, at the present time, well, when the detectors were on, we were seeing uh, one pair of black holes collide per month while the detectors were operating, approximately. And so, with, an in, with reaching design sensitivity, it will be instead 27 times more frequent, or about one per day by 2020. Huge number of black hole collisions, large number of neutron star collisions, and many other things that we never, uh, some of which we have never dreamed of, some of which we have. We do expect at design sensitivity to see gravitational waves from neutron stars, that have small mountains on their surfaces and that spin. And as they spin, the mountains going around and around produce a steady output of gravitational waves. We expect to see gravitational waves produced when a black hole tears apart a neutron star, opening it up for all the world to see. We have seen uh, gravitational waves and who know, neutron stars collide. Uh, we will ultimately, though this is very rare, see gravitational waves and particles called neutrinos produced in the core of what is called a supernova explosion. These are the most bright explosions that you see with light in the universe. Much less bright than the gravitational wave bursts we've seen. But there you get supernova explosion, you get a light out. And we don't understand how supernova explosions are produced and we will learn from the gravitational waves and particles called neutrinos. And there will be very big surprises. So this is the kind of thing I expect. Uh, most of this will happen, I think, by about 2020. Now, it's quite interesting, the technological challenge of making these improved detectors work. And I can describe this in the following way. It was Vladimir Braginsky, my close Russian friend, who told us already in 1968 that however you try to detect gravitational waves, whatever method you use, you ultimately must w monitor, follow the motions of heavy masses at a level where the motions are so small that the masses are jiggling violently and randomly due to quantum mechanics, what's called quantum mechanics. We know that inside an atom, 
an electron runs around randomly inside an atom, and you can never say precisely where the electron is, whether it's here or there or here. Uh, and similarly, we in advanced LIGO then, we have the problem, as Braginsky predicted, that uh, we're trying to measure the motions of these mirrors at a level that there are random fluctuations due to quantum mechanics, unpredictable fluctuations that cannot be stopped uh, of the location of the mirrors at the same level as the gravitational waves we're trying to detect. And that is a potential problem, obviously. How do you get a gravitational wave through a mirror that is bouncing around randomly and you're trying to see the gravitational wave by the motion of the mirror as measured by light. So for the first time, humans will see human-sized objects behave in this quantum mechanical way. 40 kilogram mirrors doing this, 40 kilo mirrors doing that. And so there was a challenge, and this is what Bregensky's research group in Moscow and my research group in Caltech began working on in 1979 together, and we continue to work on this, uh, his successors and my successors, on developing what is called quantum non-demolition technology, a new set kind of technology to enable you to uh, make measurements in the presence of these random fluctuations of the uh, mirrors. So that is just one example of what we have to uh, deal with when we uh, go beyond advanced LIGO. Uh, if we can do this, and we don't, do know how to do that, and the techniques are, have been perfected, they have been tested, and they will begin to be installed in LIGO uh, this autumn and begin to operate uh, in January. Then, by the early 2020s, we will have a new set of detectors, improved detectors, called LIGO A+, that will be able to see 1.6 times farther than advanced LIGO, seeing black holes collide a few times per day. By the late 2020s, if we have the money to do this, we will have a new generation of detectors that can see black hole collisions one per hour. And by the 2030s, uh, new sets of detectors. It's called the Einstein Telescope in Europe, and it's called Cosmic Explorer in uh, America. That can see uh, that's a total of about uh, about 15 times farther than advanced LIGO sees, and we will see every black hole collision in the universe that ever occurred in the universe, going back going back to the uh, formation of the first black holes with masses below 1,000 solar masses. And this is not all. Within the next 20 years, we will have four different frequency bands in which we're looking at gravitational waves. It will be as though we had started to do optical astronomy with optical telescopes, radio astronomy with radio telescopes, infrared astronomy, uh, gamma ray astronomy, four different kinds of astronomy, uh, electromagnetic astronomy, all in 20 years. We will, within 20 years, we will have opened up, as we ha have with LIGO and now Virgo, the uh, astronomy with gravitational waves with periods of oscillation of milliseconds. Uh, by the 2030s, LISA, this is a European Space Agency mission, in which three spacecraft track each other with laser beams. We'll be watching gravitational waves with periods of minutes to hours. Uh, within the next five years, I expect that a technique called pulsar timing arrays that uses radio telescopes, I won't go into the details, will be looking at gravitational waves with periods of years to decades. And at the very end of the lecture, I'll describe a technique uh, by which we expect within the next decade to be seeing gravitational waves that have periods of 100 million years to a few billion years. These four different kinds of radio gravitational wave detectors, all different types of detectors, each one exploring different aspects of the universe within 20 years. I'm going to conclude by saying a little bit about exploring black holes with gravitational waves, and then 
talking briefly about exploring the birth of the universe with gravitational waves. So begin with black holes. A black hole is not made from matter like you and I. It's made from warped space and warped time. And you can visualize this in the following way. If we take an equatorial surface right through the equator of a black hole, this is a fast, rapidly spinning black hole, uh, the geometry of that equatorial slice is not flat like the surface of this table. It's highly curved. And to visualize that curvature, that warping, we take it out and we embed it in a higher dimensional space that is flat and it looks like this. Or another way to say it is we embed it in the fifth dimension of the movie Interstellar. So everybody who understood the movie Interstellar, I'm sure you all understood it, those of you who saw it completely. Uh, there's not enough laughter. You, you don't realize how hard it is to understand this movie. If, if you uh, uh, look in from the fifth dimension of Interstellar, uh, you see that the shape of the space around the black hole is like this. The universe far away is flat. Near the black hole, it's like a funnel that goes down. The yellow, uh, the co color coding is the slowing of time. At the yellow location, time is flowing at 10% as fast as far away. And down at the bottom where it's black, time is slowed completely. That's the surface of the black hole, the horizon. It looks like a circle, but I removed one space dimension. This is just a picture of the slice through the equator of the black hole. It's just two-dimensional. When you restore the third dimension, that circle becomes a flattened sphere, the surface of the black hole. So this is what a black hole looks like with the arrows showing the dragging of space into motion by the spin of the black hole. Now, LISA, the European Space Agency mission, which will launch about 2030, I expect, has these three spacecraft that track each other with laser beams. And it can observe gravitational waves from giant black holes that weigh millions of times as much as the sun. It will also gra see gravitational waves from small black holes that orbit around a big black hole. Uh, and as the small black hole orbits around a big black hole, the waves it produces carry, encoded in themselves, a full map of the warped space and time of which the black hole is made, the big black hole, that's being explored by the small black hole. You can understand why a full map might be in those gravitational waves by looking at the orbit of the small hole around the big hole. Here I have removed the warping of space, so you can just see small hole. The orbit does not look like the elliptical orbits of the planets around our sun. It's very complicated because the big black hole spins, drags space into motion like the air in a tornado because of the warping of space, because of the uh, slowing of time near the black hole. Uh, and so the orbit ex explores the entire region around the big black hole and, and sends out a map. And so it's like uh, NASA and ESA mapping the surface of Mars, but here mapping the shapes of black holes is what we will do with LISA. And what if the central object is not a black hole, for example, if it's what we call a naked singularity, then the orbit of an object very near it may be quite chaotic, and the map will be very, very different. So we have a tool to search for unexpected kinds of objects, for example, what we call a naked singularity, uh, from the gravitational waves that are produced in the, uh, when the small object goes around the big object. So, the other thing that we are doing in exploring black holes, we have already done, is explore the dynamics of warped space-time. This is a movie of what the first black hole collision that LIGO saw looked like by somebody that looks in from the higher dimension, from what is sometimes called the bulk. And so you see, as seen from the higher dimension, you see two black holes in the form of these funnels, the color, the red color, is where time is slowing greatly. The arrows are the dragging of space into motion. And 
we watch the collision of these two black holes, this is what it would have looked like, that first collision we observed. Uh, this is a slow motion now. It's a big splash like in a storm on the ocean. Uh, we pause it. This is the moment of collision. And now we will let it oscillate and the gravitational waves go out. It is that big splash, that big uh, like an ocean wave in a storm that produced three solar masses of gravitational wave energy that produced 50 times the luminosity of all the stars in the universe produced by this behavior of warped space-time. So we are exploring this observationally with gravitational wave observations and computer simulations. Uh, this movie captures only a small portion of the space-time storm. Uh, there's a lot more to it and I'm going to skip over it because I've used up my time. Uh, but I, this is just to tell you it's a much more interesting storm than I told you about, and it is part of our exploration today. Finally, I want to talk about observing the birth of the universe. First, I'll talk about the birth of the fundamental forces of nature. The laws of physics say that there are four fundamental forces. There's gravity, there's uh, electro electromagnetism. Electricity and magnetism are one force that are united according to the laws of physics. There's something called the weak nuclear force and something called the strong nuclear force, just four fundamental forces. And these forces came into being. They were created in the early universe. And in particular, theory says that the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force, they were unified into something else when the universe was born. So electricity didn't exist. Magnetism didn't exist at the birth of the universe. They only were created, electricity and magnetism, when the, earth, the universe, according to theory, was one one trillionth of a second old. And the universe at that point was expanding rapidly. It was cooling as it expanded. And it's like taking uh, water vapor and cooling it and water droplets start to form as you cool the water vapor through 100 degrees uh, Celsius. And so it is thought that this uh, could have also occurred in the same way as water droplets form in droplets. So inside this droplet, the electromagnetic force exists. Outside, it does not exist. And once these droplets form, inside which we have the new force, they, according to theory, expand nearly as fast as the speed of light. They collide and they produce a burst of gravitational waves which then travel out through the universe and are seen by LISA to, uh, when LISA goes into operation around 2030. And so we are looking forward to, with LISA, watch the birth of the uh, electromagnetic force. And with LIGO we could similarly see this if there was some sort of new force born when the earth was, when the universe was 10 to the minus 22 seconds old, the very, very early in the universe. Finally, and this is my last uh, uh, slide or animated slide, gravitational waves created in the Big Bang itself. According to theory, there had to be some amount of gravitational waves produ produced there. When whatever gravitational waves were created at the birth of the universe, there was a early phase of expansion of the universe that was very fast, according to theory, called inflation, and that inflation is predicted to have amplified, strengthened the gravitational waves that were born at the beginning of the universe. And so we have then very strong gravitational waves coming out. And when the universe was about 400,000 years old, it was cooling, and at that point, it cooled enough that neutral hydrogen atoms could form, and for the first time, it turns out, light could propagate. Electromagnetic waves could propagate. Before that, electromagnetic waves were trapped. They were absorbed, emitted, scattered. They just couldn't go anywhere. After that, they could propagate. And theory says that the gravitational waves from the birth of the universe should interact with the hot gas when the universe is about 400,000 years old to produce a pattern of what you call polarization, like you see with Polaroid glasses, that is on these, these, this radiation that is seen today as microwave, so-called cosmic microwave background. And so 
the uh, astronomers have seen this polarization pattern, but there is noise in it that has not been cleaned up yet. And when that gets cleaned up, these uh, polarization pattern will tell us about the very birth of the universe, what came off the Big Bang, and about the inflation that amplified those waves. And we will actually see these primordial gravitational waves with another instrument that is looking at a very different frequency band, a successor to the LISA mission in about 2050. So I look forward to the time when we have data about the birth of the universe from two different kinds of instruments. And I look forward eagerly to those data uh, showing gravitational waves that completely disagree with theory. And that uh, we then struggle as uh, physicists to understand what went wrong, why our theories of the birth of the universe were wrong. And I think that's what's going to happen. So let me just conclude by saying it was 400 years ago that Galileo built his first optical telescope, pointed at the sky, and discovered the four biggest moons of Jupiter, pointed at, the, at our moon and discovered the craters on the moon. It was just two and a half years ago that the LIGO detectors first discovered gravitational waves from colliding black holes. Now, when you recognize what a complete change there has been in our understanding of the universe since Galileo due to electromagnetic astronomy over those 400 years, I invite you to think about what changes might there be over the next 400 years looking with gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. I expect the changes will also be enormous and that our descendants will look back on us today as having initiated, as, as Galileo did, a huge beginning of a huge revolution in our understanding of the universe. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this beautiful lecture. Um, allora, vi è piaciuta la conferenza? Benissimo. Scommetto che... Dopo una conferenza del genere, la testa di solito esplode dalle, da tutte le domande che si sono formate ne, nel corso dell'ora a cui abbiamo assistito. Però eh, capite che siamo 876 e eh, quindi se tutti hanno una domanda, anzi scommetto che alcuni ne hanno anche di più, eh, finiamo tra tipo tre anni. Quindi eh, abbiamo selezionato in anticipo delle domande da, eh, dalle domande che ci sono state poste dagli studenti delle scuole in cui siamo andati a tenere delle lezioni. Quindi eh, we, eh, andiamo avanti con queste. We've got uh, some questions for you. And uh, let me say, I have not seen these questions. So <laughs> <laughs> she didn't show them to me. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, connected to interstellar. Is uh, the presence of gargantua important for the existence of the wormhole? And uh, if the answer is uh, yes, uh, how does it work? <laughs> so I think the existence of gargantua uh, was not important for the existence of the wormhole, uh, except for the fact that around gargantua there are planets that could support life. And in this movie, there's a very advanced civilization, uh, which throughout the movie, the name of the civilization is they. So the actors keep referring to they. They did this, they did that. So this very advanced civilization, they created the wormhole to link our solar system to 
the vicinity of Gargantua, not because of the black hole, but because of the planets that could be lived on, that were habitable, that were heated by the uh, heat that came from the disk, hot disk of gas around Gargantua. Uh, and so uh, that's why the, uh, they put the wormhole there, uh, the planets rather than the black hole. But the black hole's disk is what is keeping the planets warm so they could support life. Uh, so, so let me say about this just a bit, a bit more. For those of you who don't know Christopher Nolan movies, Christopher Nolan, his movies are always very hard to understand, but very entertaining. And uh, you have to, uh, if you're puzzled by the movie, you have to watch it five times. Uh, and you'll discover that the explanation for the things that are very hard to understand is in the dialogue somewhere else in the movie. So that's just the secret you ultimately learn about Christopher Nolan. And so the mysterious things in this movie, you watch it and you look for the dialogue elsewhere in the movie that will explain what you didn't understand. Okay, go ahead. Um, have you ever thought about uh, giving up your quest for uh, gravitational waves? I, I never thought about giving up the quest. Um, so I'm a theorist. I think I understood as well as anybody uh, how strong the waves would be. I understood what the uncertainties were. So I knew where we had to go. But I also worked very closely with the experimenters. When I was a, working on my PhD, I was also a member of an experimental gravity research group led by uh, Robert Dickey at Princeton. And although I was not doing experiments in that group, I was actually doing a nuclear physics experiment, although I was a theorist. I learned how experiments are done, uh, and so, so I could work at the interface, uh, and I understood what the experimenters were doing. I could help them understand their noise and so forth. So I had enough of a view of, of what had to be done uh, that, that I was, and I knew how good the experimenters were because I was working closely with them. Uh, and I was quite confident that uh, they could pull this off. I knew where we had to go. I knew at the pace at which they were going. And uh, so I, I never was tempted to quit. But I should also say the other reason I was not tempted to quit was it was so much fun. My grandfather told me when I was four, he said, if you find a job when you grow up that is like play, you will have succeeded. Well, searching for gravitational waves was like play. Be because each, each step along the way involved puzzles that had to be solved. And, solving, and you were doing it together with uh, cl close friends. They were wonderful people to work with, together trying to solve puzzles, uh, fascinating puzzles. Uh, and the feeling of triumph when you solve even just a little puzzle was, and you're doing it with a friend, it just makes it all, all, all quite joyous. And so, so uh, Ray Weiss and I have discussed this many times and uh, we both agree, it, neither of us had any, was attempted at all to quit in large measure because it was so much fun. What changes uh, has the Nobel Prize brought to your ordinary life? <laughs> and could you please tell us an amusing anecdote? <laughs> so what changes have the Nobel Prize brought? I get twice as much email as I used to get. <laughs> I get three on average three invitations each day to give a lecture somewhere in the world. And I say, on average, I turn down 2.98 uh, invitations a day. <laughs> um, when I walk through an airport, uh, somebody usually recognizes me. I don't know whether that's because of Interstellar or the Nobel Prize, but uh, <laughs> those are the changes. That's all. That's all. Uh, uh, And so you asked for an amusing 
story. Well, it's partly amusing, perhaps, and partly it, it has a message. Um, I received the telephone call from uh, the Secretary General of the Nobel Foundation at 2.15 in the morning uh, on October 3rd. I was asleep. Uh, I was not expecting to call until 3. Uh, and he, he said to me, it will not surprise you that we are awarding the Nobel Prize for Physics to you, Rainer Weiss and Barry Barish, uh, for contr contributions to discovering gravitational waves. I said, it doesn't surprise me at all. I was expecting it. Uh, but I'm very disappointed. And I explained that it seemed to me that the prize did not belong to us. It belonged to the entire team of the LIGO and Virgo scientists that made the discovery. And that the Nobel Foundation should by now, in the modern era, have learned how, in cases like this, to give it to a team and, instead of to individuals. And uh, he told me they had been discussing this possibility, but had not, uh, there was much opposition to it. And that we could continue the discussion in Stockholm. So in Stockholm, I had this discussion with him further, a long discussion. And uh, the argument that uh, they make on the Nobel Foundation is that uh, really the point, major reason for the Nobel Prize is to inspire non-scientists about science in the case of the science prizes. And individuals are better uh, uh, icons for science. Individuals are better inspiration than a large organization. But uh, then I argued, and I understand that, but I argued that, and still argue, that the general public, non-scientists, should uh, be made aware that so certain kinds of wonderful discoveries can only be done by large collaborations. And they, there should be an inspiration for people to collaborate, to work together, to make big things happen. And it seems to me that the Nobel Foundation also has an obligation to the world to explain that in some manner. So this argument is still going on. Uh, and uh, we, we will see what happens next time there's a similar kind of prize. One last question. Uh, since there are a lot of young students in the audience, uh, what would you suggest students undertaking a scientific career should do? So, I return to my grandfather's advice that you should undertake it only if in the end you find that it is fun, uh, that you enjoy it. There, is, there are wonderful rewards, uh, but doing science uh, it can be, if you're trying to do science at the for forefront of no human knowledge, can be very hard. It requires very hard work, hard, hard concentration, dedication. And uh, if you don't enjoy it in the process, then you should let somebody else do that and find something else that you do enjoy. So that's, again, the same message as I, as I gave once before. Uh, but if you do find that you enjoy it, then just dedicate yourself to it and uh, be ready to work very hard, but get the joys that come out of working very hard. Thank you. Invito di nuovo il sindaco sul palco. Allora, professore, torna. Io volevo fare un dono a nome. Io non parlo molto bene l'inglese, quindi magari se, farà, se Sara mi aiuta. Sa Sara? <laughs> Can you translate for me? Purtroppo non sono di quei politici che si inventa di sapere tutte le lingue e piuttosto che fare figuracce preferisco avvalermi di chi è capace. Io non parlo italiano. 
Questo l'avevamo anche <ride> quasi sospettato. Allora, eh, come amministrazione comunale noi volevamo eh, riconoscere la nostra felicità e eh, dandole onore, lei ci dà onore, della sua presenza e volevamo darle un segno di riconoscimento che è un segno che riserviamo agli ospiti d'onore della nostra città. È un simbolo che, eh, abbiamo, di cui abbiamo, ci siamo dotati lo scorso anno nell'ambito di un bicentenario che eh, eh, ricorda il nostro territorio, Alessandro Rossi. Questa è la, la spilla d'oro che rappresenta il monumento al tessitore, all'uomo, che è un monumento molto importante per la nostra città perché è un monumento che Alessandro Rossi donò, fece costruire, donandolo ai suoi operai. Un segno di grande socialità, un segno di innovazione e poi in mano alla navetta che è stata una grande innovazione nel sistema dell'industria dell laniera e chissà, magari ci piace pensare che guardò anche avanti. Quindi io gliela dono con grande onore. Mille grazie. Grazie. Mille grazie. Mille grazie. Mille grazie. Mille grazie. Mille grazie. Grazie mille, ringraziamo ancora il professor Kip Thorn. E... Voglio ringraziare tutti voi per aver partecipato a questa conferenza, è sempre bello vedere quanto l'astronomia attiri ed ispiri la gente. Ecco, io vi ricordo che eh, per uscire, eh, diciamo, no, non ammassatevi, avete tutte le cuffie da eh, riconsegnare, ogni cuffia ha il suo numero, quindi dovrebbe essere un procedimento abbastanza semplice, ma dato che siamo 876 probabilmente richiederà un po' di tempo. Noi vi aspettiamo ai nostri prossimi eventi. Buona serata a tutti.